Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Your Freedom Unlimited with me, Jen Ramsey. And can I just tell you, I am so excited about our guest this week. I'm very excited about introducing you to Marianne Alder. Marianne, I have met on the incredible social media platform called Clubhouse, and uh, she and I have had a couple of conversations, and I'm so excited to be bringing her to you today on Your Freedom Unlimited. Let me give you a little bit of background before I introduce Marianne to you. So Marianne is one of the first black daytime soap opera heroines in American TV history as criminal attorney Dee Dee Bannister on, on the ABC's Edge of Night. She, though today now, she is now prosecuting ageism and she is an age anarchist. She has a fantastic TED talk called Ageism is a Bully, Stand Up to It. She has a solo show, Getting Old as a Bitch, but I'm going to wrestle that bitch to the ground, and as an AARP age disruptor. Other TV career highlights for Marianne include starring opposite Red Fox and Della Reese as their daughter Elizabeth on CBS's The Royal Family, recurring as Lita Ford and Anthony's uppity girlfriend on CBS's Designing Women, and co-starring opposite OJ Simpson as his wife Ellen on HBO's First and Ten. Marianne is also a certified hypnotherapist on a mission to snap us out of the trance that women lose value as we get older. So I just want to really welcome you here to the show today, Marianne. It's just such an honor to have you here and thank you for spending your time with us. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Yeah, well, I just, I just think you've got an incredible story to share with us and, and I just really appreciate your time. And there is so much there that we could talk about. And before we started recording, there was even more that came up. But um, you have had one incredible career, one incredible life, and you're still going. Um, you are you're about to turn 73 next week, you told, just, yep. just told me. So that's incredible. And I love this energy and that you have and this role modeling that you're giving all of us in this space of aging. But before we get to talk about that, I'd just love to wind back the clock to hear some of your backstory and some of that, some stories of your early life and what led you that drive for you to, to get involved in um, television and to be such a star in that space. Well, I was born in 1948, and, which means I grew up in the 1950s. And at that time, I didn't see too many people on television who looked like me. But there was a show, I don't know if it played in Australia, but it certainly played, it was very popular in the United States, The Mickey Mouse Club. Did you yes. know The Mickey Mouse Club? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, the first Mickey Mouse Club, um, there was a musketeer who was very popular, Annette Funicello. And Annette was Italian. She had olive skin and curly black hair. And you know, we, when you're a child, you don't know race, you just know colors. And she was someone who looked like me. And I thought, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be when I grow up. Well, when I grew up, at the time I was maybe six or seven, growing up to me meant like 11 or 12. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to be, I thought, I knew all the songs. I, you know, I, to this day, to, to, as a matter of fact, today is Tuesday in my part of the world. Today is Tuesday, you know what I mean. We're gonna have a special guest. I mean, I remember that, that was like 70 years ago, 60 years ago. I love it. I love it. But, but um, yeah, so there was just, I was always kind of a rambunctious kid. I had a lot of energy. As an older adult, I still have a lot of energy. So you could only imagine what I was like as a child. And so my parents put me into classes. I had acting classes and dance classes and anything to get me out of the house and out of their hair. And it sort of calmed me down. Um, and it's funny because the edge of night came on right before the Mickey Mouse Club. It came on at four o'clock and then Mickey Mouse came, came on at 4.30. And when I talk to young people, especially as a motivational speaker, I say the secret to achieving something is to aim for the stars. Because even if you don't make it, you'll still make it to the moon. And I say, I never, achieved my big dream. I aim for the stars. I never made it to the Mickey Mouse Club, but I made it to the edge of night. I made it to the moon and that's not half bad. 
I think that's incredible. And what a great um, vision that you had to do that. And how funny that those two shows were next to each other on the show lineup. That's just, just incredible. But I do remember the Mickey Mouse Club. It was fantastic. So, um, yeah. but I'm just so pleased that you attained that dream. Yeah. Well, we talked about that a little bit, you know, before mm. in that little pre-conversation. Um, my father was a Pullman porter on the railroad and he would bring books and usually comic books that people would leave on the train. But when I was nine years old, he left, a, he brought home a book called Psycho Cybernetics. So I was nine years old reading Psycho Cybernetics. So at that very tender age, I started imagining what I wanted my life to look like. And so I do believe energetically, I created that. I co-created that with the universe. And the fact that the Mickey Mouse Club should come on right, bumped up again to the edge of night, that's kind of like what I call a God wink. That's God saying, I got this. You, this was me. And um, so, yeah, yeah. I, from a very early age, uh, which is why I wanted to do this interview with you, because you have a wide array of guests who talked about the the universe and cosmic consciousness and quantum physics and all of that good stuff. And that's, that's the beginning of freedom. When you recognize that this is what creates everything, it frees you from so much. It frees you from despair. It frees you from, from uh, depression. It frees you from, from the urgency that you have to do it all yourself. Oh, because... I Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> because, because you don't have to. I mean, when I, I mean, in, um, I was raised Catholic, but I, I am a practicing religious scientist because I believe that we are the one. And in religious science, I'm sure you're familiar with this, there's treat, but move your feet. In other words, create a consciousness, but do the work in front of you. So I just do the work in front of me as it presents itself with my eye, my imagination on what I want things to look like. And when I feel that I've, okay, this is as far as I know what to do in my humanness. And then I let go and let God, I go like, yo, God, you got this. I I'm done. It's on you now. I, what I, and I look, I completely agree with you. And, I, and if anything, I, I haven't heard that term, but that's certainly, I think I would say that's where I'm at as well in terms of there is this consciousness that we can then tap into. And I, that was my same realization was that that's when we get freedom. When we don't realize, when we realize we don't have to do it all. We're not in this horrible, you know, place that's not supportive. It's actually quite the opposite. We're completely supported if we believe it and where we have our focus. So how incredible that your dad bought you that book at that age. Like that's a very significant book, Psychosybernetics. And the fact that you got that at nine, you know, again, synchronicity you know you're being handed something literally from the universe you know marianne have a look at this i've heard you speak on your ted talk before we move on a little anymore i wanted i've heard you speak on your ted talk about the influence of your father and his determination for you and your sister to get education he sounds like an amazing man what sort of influence did he did he have on did he and your mother have on your lives well my my parents were total opposites how those two ever got together I, I, I'll never know, but, um, but they did. My, my father was always very, uh, very social and very positive. Now my mother was too, but I think in today's world, she would have been diagnosed as chronically depressed. My mother was brilliant. I mean, she was smart, she was funny, but there was something always very sad about her and and I think maybe she was a, a bit agoraphobic because she was a housewife. She was a stay-at-home housewife and my dad went to work and she, as much as she resented being at home, I think she liked the safety of being at home. So with me, there were two trains running. The idea of my father saying, you can do anything, you can be anything and me looking at my mother and realizing that I did not want to be like that. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I didn't, you know, so I was, I had this sense of drive and which I got from not wanting to be like my mother. And I had this sense of 
self-confidence because my father told me I could do or be anything. As I said in my TED talk, he said to me, don't let anybody else's no stop your yes. Mm. What a what an inspirational man. And together, it's interesting how people get together and but somehow it all works and their relationship obviously, you know, birthed you. Well, it and worked your for me. I don't know how it worked for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like it worked okay for them, but and <laughs> and how great though for your father to speak those words over you know that you know don't let you know just just keep going you can do this I just think that's that's fantastic so such an inspiration to and such an encouragement for you to go and do what what it was that you wanted to do yeah so and you know there's a I'm sorry go ahead no 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 go 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 um, I was going to say uh, there is because you know I trained as a hypnotherapist we'll get to that later but you know, what happens into the subconscious mind and the stories that we tell ourselves. I think we all have this sense of, like Joseph Campbell says, a, a mythology, our story. What is our story? What is the mythology that's created around us? And my father said to me, now, whether it was true or not, I don't know. I'm just going to assume it was. I was born in Provident Hospital on the south side of Chicago. And it was a Catholic hospital. And my father said to me, when the nuns handed you to me, they said, this is a very special little girl. Oh. So I always had the expectation that there were things that I was destined for, that I was supposed to be doing. So even when I go through a period of hardship, or challenge, let me put it that way, a challenge. Um, I know I'm jumping around here. I'm gonna jump now to my son. Something that my son said to me when I was going through a particularly rough time after the edge of night was canceled. And I just remember saying to him, he must've been about 12 at the time. I said, oh, why does it always have to be so hard? And he said to me, mom, you know what your purpose on the planet is to inspire and motivate people. If it was easy for you, it wouldn't be that good a story. Ah, I out of the out of the mouths of babes. I what cannot argue all? with him. I, you know who's going to argue with that? No, that's wisdom from a twelve-year-old. That's incredible. Ah, but when he was four, this is when he was four. Um, I had a cousin who was in a difficult marriage. And she said, oh my God, I just can't take it anymore. And she was gone like that. Six months previous, she had a brain aneurysm. Six months previous to that, she had come to New York to visit us. And so Christopher, my son, got a chance to meet her. And you know when you get those phone calls at four o'clock in the morning? And I remember distinctly Talking on the phone, we had, we had telephone tables then and, you know, dial telephone phones, talking on the phone at ah. the TV, at the little telephone table. And my son comes walking out. I remember what he was wearing. He was wearing a blue flannel onesie, you know, with the little plastic crackled feet. Oh. And I remember the little satin bunny rabbit that he had right there. And he came up to me and he said, Mommy, what's the matter? And I thought, how do I explain death to a child? And I just said, Angie died. Mm. She was gone. He literally took my hand, covered his hand over my hand and said to me, Mommy, you have to die so that you can live. Because if you didn't die, you wouldn't live. Are he you, was four. Are you, I, I get. I have goosebumps. You can't see them. I have goosebumps right now. I get goosebumps every time I tell that story. I've got goosebumps. That's incredible. He was four years old. He was, and then he just turned around like like a little like a little Buddha. He just turned around and walked away, walked back to his room. Unbelievable. Yeah. And True. whenever I tell that story, and I've told it a number of times to girlfriends and people who have been in difficult situations, I say. What is it that you have to die to so that you can live? Yeah. Negative thoughts, negative people, negative circumstances. What do you have to die to so that you can live? That's right. 
your own story, your story about yourself, your victim story. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I look, I just think that's incredible, Marianne. What your son sounds amazing. We'll have to find out what he's doing later. I want to, but I want to hear it back to you. Okay. He sounds he sounds amazing. I'm sure whatever he's doing now is, is amazing. He's 47 now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, a life well lived, I'm sure. I'm I'm sure. So Yes, I mean, what incredible wisdom there from from a young from uh, uh, literally out of the mouths of babes, and it's very true. What, and we're so circling into all of the themes that I love to cover on this podcast. I'm just so excited that we've just come straight into this conversation around, you know, you know, consciousness, and then also this concept of really living our lives as opposed to being. One of the things that I talk about is. I talk about this notion of really stepping in and participating and living your life as opposed to being the spectator on the bleachers, you know, because, and I know for a long time I did that and I won't go into that backstory, but right now, but what I will say is that it's, it's a difference between night and day and there are things that you actually have to die to. And a lot of it, what I found for me was, it was my own stuff. It was my own stories about myself. It was my own victimhood about things and not really getting some of these things that we talked about earlier in terms of the fact that we, we can and do create our own reality with our thoughts and, and our focus and our emotions. So, so exciting. So perhaps we might come back to a bit of your backstory before we get into more of those topics. But so we skip pretty quickly into from Mickey wanting to be in the Mickey Mouse Club to actually being on Edge of Darkness how did edge of the night i'm sorry we <laughs> we, have, we actually had a series in australia called edge of darkness that's where that came oh, okay <laughs> okay but um so how did you go so you 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 had this vision as a child you you got the book psycho cybernetics at 9 you understood that sometimes you could actually focus and and create how did it go then for you to then go from being that little 9 year old girl to actually then getting on to Getting getting into the, getting into that, those roles. I mean, because that's that's an incredible achievement. You were the first black time, black daytime soap opera heroine. Well, not the first, but one of the first. Well, one of the first. Okay, so one of the first. So you're one of the first. So you're really you're blazing a trail there for women and and black women. So how did you get? The, how did all of that happen? Well, I I did plays when I was in high school, but I also was the features editor on the school paper. And then when I got to college, I wrote for the school paper. And then I also toured with the Southern Illinois University Touring Theater Company. And when I graduated, my first jobs were actually in, in publicity because no one in my family was in show business. And my parents didn't think that that was a very practical career. <laughs> so I, I did the fallback job. And I, I did that in New York. I was an account executive for Burson Mars Stellar Public Relations. And then I was a unit publicist for ABC TV. So I was moving a little bit closer to my dream, getting a little closer to show business. And at the time, I was, I was married, I was pregnant, and when I went out on maternity leave, I auditioned for a theater company, and I got the job. Wow. The very first job I auditioned for in New York, and I thought, okay, this is a sign, because when I had toured with the, with the theater company in college, our advisor had said, you know, you're really good at this. You should never give this up. And there was a part of me that felt that I had betrayed my talent by going to the public relations. Mm. And to me, my belief is that talent is what God gives to you. Mm. What you do with it is your gift back to God or the divine intelligence, whatever it is that you want to call it. But I, and so I felt that I had betrayed my talents and this was, God saying to me, okay, I'm going to give you another chance. Go for this. It may not be easy all the time, but stick with it. And, and also I felt that uh, when my husband and I got married, we were college sweethearts. When he married me, I was, you know, a working woman. I had a job. So I always made the decision that we had a contract, a marital contract. And I was going to honor my end so that if he married me and I was working and I was making money, then I was going to make money as an actress. 
It's not like, okay, I'm going to be an artist now and you have to support me. And, you know, and this is the thing, you know, there's this trope of the starving artist. There is a big one. If, if you think that to be true, that will be true. It doesn't have to be true. And I, I always thought if it's like, if I'm going to be act, I'm going to get paid for it. And I made a good living, you know, for a good amount of years until I hit 50 something and they stopped calling me in Hollywood. Uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about ageism. But um, yeah, so I would say to anyone who is in pursuit of a career in the arts, eliminate, cancel, starving artist. It doesn't have to be either or, it can be yes and. You can be an artist and make money. Oh, I love what you've said. And I'm just gonna give you some incredible backstory because my background is, is that I wanted to go to art, dr dramatic art school here in Australia. But my parents didn't think it was a practical idea. So guess what I did? PR and I worked for an agency and I know Burson Mustella I know know it very well and a, a colleague of mine worked for them in Hong Kong for many years so I I see a lot of comparisons and I agree there is a sense of having if you don't go for it in that dream it's you you don't get that chance to actually yeah you you, you know you you potentially have not followed, followed through but you did and you got this incre this incredible break so it was God, the universe saying, yes, we want you to come ahead. And then you kept yourself in work like this and not just any old work, you did incredible work. And I, I, and I just that whole, I love what you said there about the starving artist and the mutual exclusivity. I can't be an artist and be successful. And I think this is a story, this is a limiting belief that people do talk about a lot. And I notice it in, in the work that I do with people. It's like, and it is that exact conversation I have with them. How about you can be this and that, not this or that. And absolutely. And I love what you're doing there. Did you just, um, just to, to stop on that point for a moment, were you very aware of potentially the story that you could tell yourself around starving artists? Um, or, or was were you aware of that at the time? Because what you're saying also highlights a high level of self-worth in your capability as an actor as well. And I know sometimes people can, the self-doubt can creep in and the negative stories and such a downward, a slippery slope. Did you, were you sort of consciously aware of these thought processes or is this something that you realise sort of looking back now at who you were and you just did it naturally? Well, remember... I was reading Psycho Cybernetics at nine years old. Well, you were, so I think you probably <laughs> so got, got the shortcut there. So, so there's that. But also, <clears throat> I had a lot of encouragement. Mm. I had a lot of positive feedback. Mm. Um, I consider my, my career as, um, this is my ministry. It's not about me. Uh, you know, I, when I coach young actors, um, which I did at the Negro Ensemble Company in New York, um, which I actually had a conservatory program that I had attended in New York. And then 30, 40 years later, I was back and I was teaching there. As an actor, I consider what I do a service industry. Mm. I am in service to the writer, to tell this story in the way that he envisioned it. I'm in service to the director. I'm in service to the audience because I have to reach them. You know, it's, it's like, it's not about me having a feeling. It's about creating a feeling in the audience. And I'm in service to the producer who's paying for everything. So yes, being an actor is, it's creative, but it is also a, very much a service industry. And I, I love, I, th I think I'm getting what you're saying there. So what you were saying, if I can perhaps interpret this back and you can tell me if I've got this wrong, you're, what you're saying is that you stepped away from um, Marianne, Al Marianne Alder, the, the ego, and you stepped out of that into being in of service to the other, in service to the, the writer, the actor, the audience, or sorry, the writer, the director, the producer, the audience. Right. So by stepping out of yourself, you're actually able to give more of yourself and to be more transparent and, and probably a lot more successful too, I would say. Right. Also, it eliminates any self-consciousness. That's right. Because, because not you're not focusing on you. 
And yeah. also, I have, if there's any actors here, this is a little actress trick that I, <clears throat> that I use. When I've done all my homework, when I've created the backstory about the character that I've created, and I've, I've done all the intellectual work, I will then stop and do a meditation because energetically I have created this character. So it exists somewhere energetically in the ether. Feels and I sit and I do a meditation and I then ask the character, what have I missed? What is it that you want the audiences to know about you? Wow. I love that. And what answer, just could you give us a little snapshot, maybe of one character that you did that with and the answer that came back? I mean, you are so speaking my language, Marianne. I'm so excited that we've met. But, yes, what, what, what's come back when you've asked that question? I think, well, first of all, every character, well, first of all, <clears throat> in my solo show, <clears throat> I created the character, which I totally wrote. So, and I created the character adult sex ed evangelist and mojo motivator, Dr. Ginger, which is a little play on words because Marianne Ginger Gilligan's Island. Okay. Yep. Got it. So um, once I had written the character and it was semi-autobiographical, there are certain parts of my life that I had, I had infused into the character, but you know, gone off into a different direction. I sat and I asked that character, what is it that you want the audiences to know about you? And that's different from Marianne. And it's, it's fascinating because, I mean, even though I know that I wrote this piece, it's not like I'm doing a solo show about me. No. This is a totally different performance art character. And it's funny because I love her. She's different from me. I mean, she just cracks me up. She's a ballsy broad. I love her. Well, I am too a little bit, but, but I just, I am separate from her. And there are things that she is more knowledgeable about than I am. I think she is a little bit ahead of where I am. So maybe she's where I want to be. Uh -huh. So I, I, yeah, I, that's one of the, that's the main character that I sat with. And I said, I wrote it out. I did all the intellectual work. And then I sat and I said, what else do I need to know about you? And what is your message to the audience? What is it that you're trying to convey? And when, oh, I cannot tell you how many times when I meet women after the show, they tell me, were you a fly on the wall in my bedroom? How did, you're telling my story. So, you know, as I made it personal, it became universal mm. because this is, because this, you know, this is every woman's story because it starts from, uh, you know, at the beginning she says, you know, all I ever wanted to be growing up was daddy's little princess, which I was until my baby sister came along and I got bounced off his knee and pushed from my throne. But when I turned 13, I discovered boys. And I came to a new awareness that daddy wasn't the only man in the world who would ever love me. Mm. Thus, I began my quest to find Prince Charming, one that I didn't have to share, and to live happily ever after. Alas, Things didn't exactly turn out the way I planned. And then it goes on from there. And she just tells the whole story of like uh, dating as a teenager, what it was like going through puberty, what it was like when she got married, what it was like when she got divorced, what it was like with her first sleepover date post-divorce. I mean, it's all of these things that, you know, that, so it's a series of, of monologues. Yep. A series of, yeah. I love it. And she, but obviously that character that you'd sort of, you stepped in and she then informed those things so that she could truly, she probably told you those things that she could truly be universal, you know, have universal appeal to all these women. Cause you're talking about all these incredible life moments that we all have as women and as men, but as women, we certainly do. So, wow, that's incredible. And I just, I, I think your, I can tell your your I mean your your career your track record highlights the the skill that you've got but the way that you've honed your craft with that understanding of 
of you know of the ethers of the field and what what is possible and how we can bring this in is incredible so i just want to Absolutely. honor you for that work that you've done and but how and now the fact that you are training you've been training other actors as well to to really give them that skill because i think this this whole thing particularly in the and it's in many industries look you know i look at the um, the spiritual in industry, people who actually want to give of their heart and be of service but can't somehow open their mouths. It's this, again, it's this, and I think it's probably universal for any of us is that there's something, I talk on this podcast when I'm not interviewing people, I, I do some content of my own and I've, the last few weeks I've been talking about fear and one of the things that, um, and that's when you and I met, we were talking about fear on Clubhouse and um, one of the things that I think we the things that we most want in life, I believe, are on the other side of our fear. But, Absolutely. you know, but the thing is, is that we, we don't go for it because we might somehow lose out on the other thing that whatever we have right now. And this, this idea, I think, that we're really sort of sharing today that you can have that and that as opposed to you can have that and not that. So I think that's, that's just really incredible. So, but you know, fear is, I mean, to, to abolish, eliminate fear, <clears throat> it's like working that muscle. Uh, you know, you, you do, it's like, well, there was a book that was out maybe 30 years ago, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Yep. Some people wait for the fear to go away. They say, okay, when I get enough courage, no, you do it and you build courage. That's it. That's exactly right. And the only way you build courage is by, you're right, by flexing that muscle and by continuing Absolutely. on. And when we don't, when we actually don't, this has been my experience, I've experienced high functioning anxiety. When we don't, we actually get smaller, we, we retract we get smaller and smaller and smaller. And then we have that desire not to do anything because it's because it's fearful to do anything. And it's so it's just that I often think of the I often think of the beautiful, you know, the fern, the fern frond that unfurls its beautiful, um, you know, it's it's beautiful leaf. It starts so tightly curled up, but it, bit by bit it just opens up. And I think that's what we need to do around fear. We need to just keep opening to it, keep opening, because those things that we want are on the other side of it. So right. let's perhaps then move now. You so you mentioned you were you had and you did you had this incredible career in the arts and in acting in Hollywood. And then you mentioned that um, you mentioned that you know, and when you turned fifty in your fifties, that we, you perhaps weren't getting as many calls. Could you yeah. share with us what happened and what was sort of was there a break? Was there a you mentioned there was a time of depression? Was there sort of some sort of breakthrough that you got through that? What what happened in that stage of your of your journey? Okay, if you don't mind, I want to double back to something that you said when you, when you mentioned high functioning and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Some people would make anxiety the operative word, but you made functioning the operative word. You know, it's again, those two things can coexist, but which thing do you focus on? That's and it. you focus on the functioning and that's what gets you through you know, and that anxiety part holds people back. And to that point, I'm going to double back even further. When I got on Edge of Night, Edge of Night was an ABC show. Seven years prior to that, I had been an ABC publicist. And daytime was my beat. And the way the publicity department was laid out was kind of like a newsroom. So there were three rows of desks staggered. <clears throat> and when I went under, con when I was signed under contract, the woman who was now in charge of my old daytime beat had been there when I was there. And when it came time for her to write my bio, she said, you're really good at this stuff. You wanna just write it yourself? And I said, no, Audrey, <laughs> you're gonna write it but I know which questions you should ask me. <laughs> so she did, she wrote my bio and at the end of it, she, cause I was in her, in there back at, at ABC at the, at the, in the office. <clears throat> she looked up at me and she said, wow, you really done something with your life. Wow. And that really, that really, I think I just made a clinky noise with the microphone. Oh, good. <laughs> because I thought, 
if you don't feel that you have done something with yours, that is so sad. Yep. But once again, it was a reinforcement. Do something with your life. Whatever it is that you decide to do, because only you can decide to do it, what's important. And um, because at the end of your life, you know, it's like, have I, do I have disappointments? Absolutely. There are things that I wish had, worked, had turned out another way. But I have no regrets because I went for it. And, you know, disappointment is a lot easier to live with than regret. It really is. You're right. And there's a bit, there is a gulf between those words. And yes, things happen that we cannot be happy about, which then that's part of life. You're right. But there is a gulf between disappointment over how things turned out versus the deep regret of not doing things, not doing that thing you're born to put, put on the earth to do. Right. I agree with you. It's, it's, right. And I think the struggle for a lot of people is, is to understand how to step into that thing, to have reduced the fear, to drop the fear, to actually step into your voice, drop into, step into what it is that you're really you know, focused on doing. So, what a, yeah, that is a bit of a heart moment, isn't it, when she said you've really, really done something with your life. And she's saying that to you really at the beginning of your, that's a bit, almost close to the beginning of your acting career. Is that right? You've done a bit of acting? Uh, well, I had done, from the time I, when my son was three, three months old, when I started working with the street theater company, and he was eight when I was on Edge of Night. In between then, I did a lot of television commercials. Um, television commercials supported my acting habit of doing theater for no money or very little money. And uh, because remember, I said at the beginning, my husband married a working woman. I was going to make sure I, I brought home a paycheck. And uh, so I, I honed my craft. I stayed in class. I did theater. You know, I, as I say in my TED Talk, I did theater so far off Broadway, I had to take two subways and a bus to get there. I mean, my God. And, but I loved it. I loved what I was doing. I was learning, I was creating, I was really honing my craft. Now, the irony is that just when I think I'm getting really good at it, they're not hiring me anymore on television because that's what happens to women in Hollywood. They face ageism, especially since I was more of a leading lady than a character actress. Mm -hmm. And my agent suggested that I gain 50 pounds so I could do more character work. And I said, I don't think so. I already have really? high blood. Yes, he really did. Now, was he joking? I don't think so. I think he thought, well, it's something to consider. And I already have high blood pressure, which I is genetic. I, taken diazide since I was in my 40s. And I, I thought, I don't want to add high cholesterol to it. No, 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 no. no. So I, but I still had to make a living. By this time I was divorced. And so I think actors have a natural curiosity about human nature and behavior. At different times in my life, I had been in therapy, but I, I was always very curious about hypnotherapy. I became a hypnotherapist. I spent a year in training. And most of my clients, when I was doing my residency, I, I did it at the Hypnosis Motivation Institute in Tarzana, California. And most of the women were in their late 40s, early 50s, and they were suffering from midlife depression. Most of these women were wealthy women. You know, they were they were now empty nesters. They didn't know what to do with themselves. Their husbands were successful. They didn't need to work, but what, they, what were they going to do? And that's when I realized that we have, as a society, been hypnotized into believing that women lose value and social and sexual currency as we get older. So they thought they had lost their looks. They had lost their, their ability to conceive because a lot of them were going through menopause. So what, of what use were they? And so a lot of these women were trying to find themselves. And, and I liken you know, women in their 50s, menopausal, to 
the adult stage of puberty, you know, when a, a girl turns like 13, 14, she's going through a period, her body's changing. She's not a child anymore, but she's not an adult yet. Mm. 45, 50, women aren't young anymore, but they haven't reached their elderhood. No. So that's that awkward stage when they're trying to figure out who they are and what they are. And also, when you think of all the things that you thought about doing in your 20s, when you reach your 50s and you realize you haven't done to any of them, you think, oh my God, I have to catch up. That's it. So as I was giving them positive suggestions, they took into my own subconscious mind. And I thought, I cannot in good conscience tell these women, you can go and be and do if I'm not doing everything that I really wanted to do. Because in my heart of hearts, I am an actress. I am a storyteller. And so my very first solo show was there at the Institute and it was in the auditorium and it was called Snap Out of It. You've only been hypnotized into believing you're over the hill. Oh, I love it. I love it. But and so that you did this, you're, you're, you're right. You can't offer advice without doing it yourself. So sorry, keep going. Yeah. So, I mean, I have to walk my talk. Otherwise, what good am I? You know, uh, so I, I did that. And then a, um, I had postcards made out, you know, to get audience to come. And a woman who I knew as an actress, cordial, but not, we weren't really friendly, saw the, uh, the little flyer for the show. And she said, what are you doing? You know, I'm, I'm kind of working on the same thing. Iona Morris. Uh, her father was Greg Morris of the Mission Impossible television series back in the 60s. Yeah. Um, and so Iona and I got together. We made salads and drank a lot of wine. And, um, and then we connected with another woman, uh, Lola Love, who had written a, a book of erotica. And our very first collaborative sketch show we were the three black chicks, spelled B-L-A-C-Q-U-E-C-H-I-C-S. Uh, and our show was Herotica. Oh, my like, gosh. And so we were each goddesses. And we, it, was, it, it was hilarious. It was really funny. It was a sketch show. We did it at, at, um, in Cabaret. And then Lola went on to do other things. And then Iona and I said, well, we'll keep going. And I, my, our second collaborative effort was a show called MOIST, which is an acronym for the Multiple Orgasm Initiative for Sexual Transformation. So, we, because, you know, this is the thing, a woman's sexual identity is very important to her emotional and physical well-being. Absolutely. Mm. And so we, we talked about, and. And when women go through menopause, sometimes they, they feel that they lose their sexual identity. And I say, no. In fact, um, I am a uterine cancer survivor. Mm. And when I, let me back up a little bit. When I was diagnosed with uterine cancer, I, the first thing I did was to do a meditation and talked to my body and I said, okay, what, what do I need to know about this? What is causing this in my body? The answer I got was, you are so much nicer to other people than you are to yourself. Wow. And I went, oh, mm. ooh. Take a breath in on that one. Yeah. Mm. And so that's when I, started saying no to things that people wanted me to do. Somebody wanted me to do something, whether I wanted to do it or not. I was, oh, well, they want me to. Some, I thought, no. And I started putting myself first, self-love. Now, if you, need a, if you needed a pint of blood, you've got it, you know? But if you want me to do something that is going to take me away from something I'm doing in this moment, either you will have to wait and we will do it later, or you will have to get somebody else to do it. 
because this is my task and I need to get this done. And so I started treating myself better. And the first thing I did after I finished my radiation was because I'm a writer, I, I turned it into stand up comedy. And I say, you know, I do not believe that not having a uterus makes me any less of a woman. I liken my hysterectomy to having an internal Brazilian. <laughs> if you're going to, because if you're going to landscape the runway, why not declutter the terminal? <laughs> because I'm still good for happy landings. And so, <laughs> so uh, and I have had women come up to me after shows and tell me who have been through that procedure with tears in their eyes saying, thank you, because it allowed them to release some sort of shame or disappointment or whatever it was that they were feeling. And again, I said, you know, that my, to me, acting is my ministry. This is how I minister, because it's not about me. I am just, God gave me these gifts or the divine consciousness or whoever, whatever made everything input this ability in me. And so how I use it is for the world. I love you know, it. it's not and about me. I love it. And it's such a, but you're, and you've had these life experiences that have allowed you, that allow you to really share, but in a funny way, in a way that's accessible. It's not dreary and serious and hard. It's, it's lighthearted, but you're showing the, I guess, the victory of the journey rather than being in the court in it and acknowledging, as you said, acknowledging women who've perhaps never been heard in that space. So just yeah. to, from an, just to, to understand your journey, where did you have that experience of the uterine cancer? And then was that so sometime post 50? I'm, I'm... Oh, that was, I was, I was 65. I was 65. <clears throat> yeah, I was 65 when I when I was diagnosed with with uh, with uterine cancer. So it was, you know, relative, you know, I just I had my five year checkup. I'm cancer free. It's like, you know, according to my insurer, it's like you never had it. You're good. Good. And and I got that lesson. So I don't see the need for ever having it again. No. Ever. No. And um, yeah, I can I just you know, you, cause you talked about being lighthearted. Mm. I, I believe that hard truths can be delivered when they're wrapped around comedy, mm. because first of all, if it's, it, it disengages the defense mechanism to say, oh no, 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 no. But when you're laughing, it's, you know, hypnotic modalities, it sinks right in. That's it. And, and something I've gotten into on Instagram on Sundays, I've been doing a Sunday night live on Instagram. And I decided I had this book in my library. I'm a big book buyer um, for at least a year that I can recall. And I decided I was going to read an essay from this book every Sunday. And I think there are maybe 40 essays, but I wanted to just read this one section because this is what I started with. And I just laughed out loud. This is my Maya Angelou's wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. This one little section, she says, it is imperative that a woman keep her sense of humor intact and at the ready. She must see, even if only in secret, that she is the funniest, looniest woman in the world, which she should also see as being the most absurd world of all times. Well, I read that and I just cracked up because I thought, I'm a loona. That's perfectly, that's my, that's my purpose, to be a loony. And you know, um, sometimes as an actor, you know, if you're a serious, you know, if you're a serious actress, you get taken a lot more seriously. Mm -hmm. And when you're lighthearted, sometimes you're not. But I thought if Maya Angelou says it's okay to be alone, who am I to argue? I'm alone. I'm going to own it. Absolutely. I agree. And yes, if Maya Angelou says it's okay, I think let's all, let's all get on that train. Let's all go in that yep. direction. I agree with you because we can, I mean, and this is to talk, to come back to, I guess, around that discussion around freedom and so on. I mean, 
joy and fun these are the freedom frequencies you know it's just when we step into that space you're right we're okay. we're actually more open to learning with the hypnotic modality we, the the truth comes in but it comes in a way so that we've got ears to listen but then also this way that we can can live our lives you know yes we all have i think the thing is we all have our ups and downs that's and certainly when you've got a few as we say in australia when you've got a few runs on the board, you know, things are going to have happened. That's what we're saying about us here. When you've got a few runs on the board, those things happen. But it's how you reinterpret that back to yourself and how you bounce back from that. So, and I, and I love that, you know, you're sharing the journey around the uterine cancer and asking your body what was going on here. That's such a powerful tool that any of us can use when anything's going going wrong is we can just go in because that that wisdom is inside of us and the fact that you had ears to listen that it was just needing for a bit more self-love right so just incredible so you have definitely um i i guess when you know there's you've had so many so let's talk a bit now about the age anarchy you're doing the one women shows um you're doing all these sorts of things i know you're on clubhouse talking about this how's what's that looking for you like now is it is it the acting is it is that really the the key part of your focus there um it is in my consciousness Mm -hmm. because i love acting it's what brings me joy and so there but there are things that i can do okay like i have my solo show this is i have my solo show and like i said it's in a bunch of it's several different stories during the course of an evening. There are about maybe 20 stories. At any given point in time, depending on the audience, I will use 12 to 15 of them because there's just a wealth of material. I can't put it all in an evening. Oh, but um, I thought, you know, at 73, do I really want to do eight shows a week traveling across the country? No. No. Mm-hmm. I want to do it one time on, you know, HBO or Hulu or Netflix or one of those things. But then I also, I was in a room and somebody said, well, why don't you turn it into a, a movie script? And I thought, I don't want to do them. No, I've already written this. But then I thought, this would make a great anthology series. If after I told one of the stories, you could get the backstory and it wouldn't have to be the same person all the time. It could be different sto- because it is different, different stories that happen in a woman's life. Mm. So since I have created that in my consciousness, I have met a lot of people on Clubhouse who are in the entertainment industry and we'll see what happens. And in the meantime, I'm doing the work in front of me which is I moderate a lot of rooms, I co-mod a lot of rooms. And every time I walk into an entertainment industry room, I lead with this. According to a 2017 Federal Reserve survey on consumer finances, women over the age of 50 in the US own 75% of the wealth. Kind of interesting. Mm. So I tell them, all these young filmmakers, use that in your pitch when you're, when you're you know, pitching the studio or the network to get your project done and make sure you have an older female character in it and maybe it will help you actually sell your product. So I'm, I'm, tr- I'm, I'm working on trying to get, I'm working on getting, not trying to get, I'm, I'm working on getting uh, women over the age of 50 and the entertainment industry together so that they can listen to some of the stories or the way that women over 50 would like to see themselves portrayed. So that will give them some ideas. I know, I don't know if I want to do it like different women pitch a story or what, I'm not sure what that's going to look like. But I do think that those two groups need to talk to one another. I completely agree. And I think what an incredible, that's very high level support that you're giving you. You know, if you talk here about, if we talk here about changing an agenda and really, you know, you're an age anarchist, that's what you're about. So you're doing your one woman shows, you're doing it, you know, one show at a time and all power to you. I'm so looking forward to when your series, your anthology series comes up, it'll, it'll be great. It will happen. I know. 
but you're also though talking to the the power brokers and the future power brokers in in those industries because really it is it's the entertainment industry the magazines it's all of the, it's a social media that's actually what what shapes a cultural view and we've seen over the last few years what you know there's been some very distressing things that have occurred but they have they have shifted a cult, the cultural views and yeah. i think you're right we're overdue a cult a shift in this space and um, I'm currently on this side of 50, but I'm about to traverse. So I, I know. Come on over. You'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's a really important conversation to be having. And for you to be doing it at that level is actually the most powerful thing you could do when you think about bringing together all of your capability, all of your knowledge, all of your experience. What what an incredible influence you're going, you, you are being. So what? how grateful am I as a woman that you're doing that because it's only by starting those conversations at that level that things are going to change. You know, that's really, it's my assignment. It is your assignment and what a jolly good assignment it is. really. (laughs) And the fact that you, you're just in a place where you can love it and you can, you can do it. And I, because I think the other thing is I have these conversations, you know, people say to me, I'm concerned about X, Y, and Z. Well, then the next question is what can we do about it? rather than complain or be concerned about it. Yes, we can be have concerns, but it's when we take that step to get out and actually do make the change or make the shift, that is actually when it when we get well, we feel certainly more fulfilled, but we'll actually make the change we want to see in the world. And I'm I, you know, I think the Buddha said be the change you want to see in the world. You know, and this is what you're talking about. You are being the change. And for those of you who are listening to this podcast rather than watching it, we are recording it. It is going to be on YouTube. So I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. Can I just say, and I don't know if it's appropriate to say this or not, but Marianne, I don't know why they stopped calling you at 50 because you still look amazing at 72, going on 73. You're absolutely beautiful. And you're a shining example of, of a healthy healthy self-worth and a healthy image as a woman in her 70s. Well, I, I'm sure that you, you're you familiar with the movie, What the Bleep? Mm-hmm. What the, <clears throat> well, you know, when you think about the, the, um, <clears throat> the neuropeptides that go into making, manufacturing the cells, the emotions create the chemicals that go into those neuropeptides. And sometimes if, you, if they're negative emotions, they can be all deformed and ugly. I always say, Happy cells are pretty cells. That's it. And they're healthy cells. So I make sure that I, that I keep my focus. I mean, I always say, you know, shit happens, but it doesn't have to stick and it doesn't have to smell real bad if you open up a window real quick. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. I completely agree. You know, so, I mean, that's the way I live my life. And this is the thing too. This is what I find disturbing is that as a baby boomer, you know, people say, oh, but you don't look your age. Yes, I do. This is what 72 looks like in Marianne's world. Mm. And so when I get scripts that say, you know, she's, she's, she's either a curmudgeon or she's crippled or she's crazy. I go like, who, why are we continuing these stereotypes? Women, people men and women are living longer lives. So should our whole, you know, the back third of our lives be just like sent out to pasture? That is so ridiculous. We have still have stories to be told that are vital and vibrant. And, and, you know, if you build it, the audience will come. They absolutely will. You're right. And with the democratization, we're seeing now even more of social media with with platforms like Clubhouse, the audience will come and the audience will come and hear you. But I agree with you. You you talk about thoughts. I like that happy cells are pretty cells. What, what, What the science is showing that our thoughts are actually light and they go through every single cell in our body. Our cells have light little, little um, connected tubes in them that actually conduct that light so we've got to be so careful of what we are thinking and feeling about ourselves because it's going to it's going to impact how we look on the outside. And oh, absolutely. You, I want to actually just ask you, what do you have a daily practice? You've mentioned meditating. You've mentioned, obviously, you're an artist, but do you have a particular daily practice that you find works well for you because you do look incredibly vital and, and healthy? I always say hydrate and exfoliate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
I drink lots of water. Well, I, you know, I've got my, I haven't, you know, I've got my water right here next to me. Um, I drink lots of water and, and I do, I used to be a gym rat. I would love to work out and work out really, really hard. I don't work out quite as hard anymore. First of all, because I can't get to the gym because of COVID. So I will do, you know, YouTube videos. I will find dance videos on YouTube and then I will just dance. You know, I'll play music and I'll just dance. And then I have uh, weights that I keep, you know, I, I will do weights and I have bands and things like that. I just do a little bit. And I have a trampoline because I found, you know, with the lymphatic system, you know, it helps to drain, you know, the, so I, I do that. But, you know, I will do that when I'm watching television. And also the um, legs up against the wall, you know, you put your legs up against the wall. Yep. I do that too. And basically, and I watch what I eat. I mean, occasionally I'll have a crap burger and fries, but I will, you know, I drink uh, healthy, you know, green juices and green juices and, and lots of vegetables and more vegetables than fruits actually, because that's a lot of sugar, but I love vegetables. Mm, absolutely and they're so full of life they're so close to life so yeah. so you're right it's that that's that daily regimen that, that really helps you right and and you we can it doesn't have to be going to the gym it's all these sorts of things that we can do but it's that conscious effort to be doing something like that every day and you're right what right. we put in does have an impact on what we put out so absolutely, absolutely just incredible um we're coming to the close of the of the interview but i, I wanted to ask um often i like to ask my guess is there a tip that you might like to share just one simple practical thing that you could share with people if they are feeling a bit stuck in where they're at right now and if they're feeling like mm, I've heard this interview and I really would like to get out and do more of what I would like to do have you got any tips or a strategy that you could suggest that people could possibly use just one one thing I'm if there's one thing that I would say it goes back to my daddy don't let anybody else's no stop your yes. Mm. And just decide on what your yes is. Because everybody's yes is different. Everybody's yes is different. It is. And that's what makes us unique, isn't it? Just that, that ability. Yep. Absolutely. Oh, and, and all power to your mum and your dad and, and your dad's beautiful wisdom. It's just, just incredible that we can honour him at the end of this interview. But... And just, you're right, don't let anyone's no beat your yes. This is about you stepping forward into your power. So, Marianne, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself with us on this interview. I'm thank really... Thank you for asking me. This, oh. was, this was delightful. I've enjoyed, you know, having a conversation with you. This is lovely. It has been really lovely. I have too, and I hope it's the first of many that we will have. I really do. I just really enjoy your company. If you would like people to contact you and to connect with you, where is it best for them to, to do? And what would you, how would you like to connect with, with people listening to you here? The best way for them to connect with me is through Instagram. Mm -hmm. DM me on Instagram, because sometimes I get inundated with all kinds of junk mail in my email. So Instagram, and I always respond to, to Instagram. So it's Marianne Alda underscore aging shamelessly on Instagram. Fantastic. And we'll definitely be sure to put that into the show notes as well so that people can connect with you. And also I want to encourage everyone to watch Marianne's uh, TED Talk. It is fantastic. And it just it gives a, another beautiful look into this incredible woman's life. And I just feel so honoured to have spent this time with you. There's many more things we could talk I'd talk about. I'd love to have you back again at some point in the future, Marianne, so we can talk with you some more. Um, but You've I, got it. <laughs> great. Well, I just feel really, it's just been such a great conversation. And thank you for all of your energy and all of your role modelling for, for what life can be like, because that was actually one thing I wanted to say earlier. You talked about Joseph Campbell and mythology, and there's a, a term that's used for women. Actually, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to stop stopping the interview. We're going to come back. I want to ask this question: What's your view on the term, the archetype crone? Have you got a new word? For you? Have you I thought about that? Love it. I yes. I I am entering my crone my cronehood. Yes, I know. Yes. As 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 a what? Because you know, when you are conscious and aware, and you're paying attention, I mean, you know, some people just go through life and they don't get the lessons. 
But when you are consciously aware, then you do have wisdom mm. and you have the wisdom that is yours to share. Because I find that I, with, especially within the last year, especially on Clubhouse, I've connected with so many women in their 40s who say, now my son is 46 and they say, you know, I lost my mom. I, and now I look at you as a, as a mother figure. And it's funny because they look at me as a mother figure. I look at them as one of my peers. You yeah. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so it's, it's, it's easy, you know, it's relatable. And, and I went, oh, you know, and it's, I find it flattering and also humbling, but that's, that is the role I've stepped into now, which is why, you know, on Clubhouse, there are a lot of, oh, fabulous 50s, 40s, this, and midlife madness and all this kind of stuff. And I realized <clears throat> that I have matriculated through that part of my life. You have, through that awkward um, plane zone that you mentioned. The, you know, and I am now firmly in my elderhood or my cronehood. Mm -hmm. And it feels pretty good. So you're okay with that term? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am. I, you know, I, uh, it's not like witches of Eastwick crone. No. It's a, it's a, it's a mytholo mythological, yes, I accept that. Mm -hmm. I, I like it. I can groove, I can groove on that. Okay, that's good. I like because because I'm not sure about it myself personally. But when I see you, you I, I like the term elderhood. I like that. But when I see you th absolutely thriving, you know, you are a role model to aspire to. I can see how women would would definitely say that to you. But um, anyway, that'll be my own little thing about the, the that archetype that I can contemplate over the next uh, next next few years. Well, you're just fifty, Jen. That's you're it. just fifty. Wait till you get to be seventy-two. That's it. I'm you still might feel a baby. differently. Yes, yes. And I'm, I may look at it very differently then. So you're exactly right. So, but I'm glad I remembered to ask that question. And the other question I realized that I had, we hadn't circled back around on, which I want to, your amazing son who had those incredible proclamations at four and 12, has he gone on to live an enjoyable life? He's, yes, he and my daughter-in-law are, just, they're both engineers. <clears throat> they both work for Cisco. I mean, they're just really nice people. Mm -hmm. And my, my granddaughter is 16. She's going to be 17 in June. My grandson just turned 14 yesterday. And it's funny because I was in clubhouse and it was a room, a midlife room. And all of a sudden I see that my daughter-in-law's in there and I went, oh, oh my God, that's right. They're middle-aged now. He's 47, <laughs> she's 45. When did that happen? Um, now there's something that my son said to me, um, when he was in his twenties and I was, cause he's, he's just, I'm, I'm writing a book about all the things that he has said throughout the, the course of my life. Ah, and so he, been... he helped me. Um, <clears throat> can you bleep out a curse word? Yes, I can do that. Okay. Because you may want to do this, but this is, you know, they will watch my, okay. My son said to me, mom, I've watched you time and time again, jump into the water to rescue someone. He said, and I've watched them pull you under. Mm -hmm. Don't do that anymore, mom. Stay in the boat, cheer them on, he said. And he said, throw them a life preserver, but don't jump in the water anymore, mom, and let them pull you under, he said. But if they insist, after you've cheered them on and thrown them a life preserver, just lean over and say, swim, fuck a swim. <laughs> He's just full of wise words. This is just... <laughs> and stop and think about it because there are people who will just like, oh, you yes. know, please help me. There's something about strong people that attract weak people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then they just, suck it all away from you yep yep and and you know my son had noticed this and he said nah, nah no don't do that let them just swim let them get just the swim. swim that's he it said, you know you're throwing them a life preserver you're willing to reel them in but you don't need to jump in the water you're not that good a swimmer yourself mom duh absolutely well 
more wise words from him. So if you're writing that yeah. book, I definitely want to have you back on the show. We can talk about that when that book comes. Okay. Because that was one of my questions was that I was hoping that you might be writing a book. There's a lot, there's a lot to you. There's I'm writing three of them. There are three of them that are in my, uh, that are in my computer right now. One is uh, uh, the book of my solo show. The other one is a, is a book that I'm writing at, about Christopher. And another one is about, it's about aging. I'm not quite sure what the title that, that might be a workbook, but um, <clears throat> one of the things Here's, an, here's, I'm going to leave you with another wonderful little, little nugget. When I, uh, I joined a Facebook group of writers and through that, I was introduced to a literary agent who was very interested in my memoir <laughs> as the memoir I was writing, because I have a lot to talk about being a young black woman growing up in the entertainment industry. Absolutely. And some of the things that I, that I experienced. And she was very excited about it. It was a pretty big literary agency. She was very excited about it. I did a book proposal. She was excited about it. She loved the stories. She came back to me after a month and she said, the, they had had the editorial board, didn't think that there was a big enough market for it <laughs> because of the social media. So I decided well, I'm going to set the writing aside for right now and work on my social media. As soon as I made that decision, a friend of mine calls me from California and tells me about this thing called Clubhouse. I went, Clubhouse? What's that? So this is what I'm working on now. I'm working on the social media. The books are in at a state of readiness. I will get to them, but I'm working on this first because I said, when I go to pitch, an agent, I will never let that happen to me again. Very good. Now, here's the, here's the little nugget. <clears throat> In order to accomplish anything, it's like cooking a meal. If you have all four burners on high, you're going to burn it up. If you keep everything on low, it'll never get cooked. So what you need to do is keep three of the burners on simmer, and turn one up on high and give it your full attention. Then when that's done, you turn it down and then you turn up the next one. And that way everything will get done. Absolutely. Oh, more wisdom. And I completely agree with you, Marianne. And you, great wisdom, you're exactly right. The, the split focus just does not work. It's something, something's got to get attention and you know it's social media, then go for it. And then when you're ready, those books will then just be on fire because you're right. Literary agents do love to see a good, good old social media following. So with that, I want to really just encourage everyone who's listening to please follow Marianne on Instagram, because this is going to be a big platform for her so that you can keep a track of what she's doing and that you'll know when those books are going to come out. You could be able to support her in this because she's sharing such an incredible message. And so now I am going to come to our wrap up to just say, okay. Marianne, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for being such a bright and transparent and clear light of love for all of us. And you're really, you are really holding the torch for a lot of women and men, but a particular lot of women, so that they'll have a completely different experience of their time after 50. And because it is, it, you're right, there's, we need to move from this invisibility to visibility. There's so much wisdom within you, so much wisdom inside every one of us that by the time we get to this part of our, of our lives, let's shine that light so that others can learn, you know? Absolutely. 